All right, so welcome everyone to the second talk of the One Pass Seminar series on uh, quantum PDs. It's a pleasure to have uh, Steven Gustafsson from UBC talking about solitons and dynamics of landau lifshitz equations in 2D. Thank you very much, Steven. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you all for coming and uh, thanks to the organizers for this opportunity to speak here. Um, so uh, I'm going to try to monitor the chat as best I can in case I see any questions pop up in the chat. I'll try to address them. Also happy to be interrupted as necessary. Uh, so I was asked to give some kind of a review of uh, some aspects of this uh, landau lifshitz equation. And that's uh, what I'm going to try to, to do. Um, so I'll introduce the, the problem. First, um, show you the model and the equation. I'll discuss uh, briefly uh, some of the questions around well-posedness of this equation or family of equations. Um, I'll discuss the topological soliton solutions of these equations. Um, First, the, the isotropic version, which leads to harmonic maps. And then a topic of perhaps more recent interest is the chiral skirmion solutions of the landau lifshitz equations. And then if there's a bit of time at the end, just a brief mention of the question of, of lattices of skirmions, which is an interesting possible direction. And I guess one of my goals here as I go is to outline some possibly interesting open questions. So there'd be lots of lots of open questions that I list as we as we go. Okay, so let's start with the model. So this is a old um, theory, sometimes called micromagnetics, um, which is, I guess, is really a phenomenological continuum theory of ferromagnets, which is supposed to somehow capture the domain structure in magnets, uh, as well as the, the way in which uh, domain structure can change from region to region. So domain wall structure, such as, as is pictured here. So the, the basic uh, object that describes the state of this of the magnet at, at uh, any time is this magnetization vector. Okay. So it's a three-dimensional vector giving the direction of the magnetization locally in, in the magnet. And it's supposed to have, a, 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 it's supposed to be a, a true direction. It's supposed to have a constant length. And so we normalize that length to, to be one. So we can think of these magnetization vectors as maps into uh, the two sphere sitting inside of the three dimensional space. Uh, for the purposes of this talk, the magnets will always be the plane. So everything will be defined on uh, R2 here. Okay, so the way you determine the, the magnetization vector um, for, for a static magnet is through an energy functional. So uh, one defines an energy on, um, on these maps or magnetiz magnetization vectors. And their energy generally has several terms. So the most important term is the, is the exchange energy or the Dirichlet energy, which is the integral of the gradient squared. And this is reflecting the ferromagnetic character of the material. It's reflecting the tendency of neighboring spins to want to align with each other. Uh, and then there's uh, generally other terms. So for example, here, this is an anisotropy, a so-called easy axis anisotropy, which is favoring uh, directions. So in this case, favoring magnetizations pointing straight up or straight down in that axis. This is an external field term, uh, an external field pointing in the positive K direction of the straight up direction, if you like. 
And then a contribution that I want to highlight in, in particular in this talk is this so-called chiral term or sometimes uh, Jeloshinsky-Maria interaction term, which uh, recently in the physics literature has shown to be relevant for certain materials is sometimes called chiral materials. And this term leads to, as we'll see later, leads to certain interesting solutions called chiral skirmions. Okay, so that's the, the energy. And then if you wanna find the static configurations, you minimize the energy or you find critical points of the, of the energy function. And then there's the dynamics. So the dynamics is given by Landau-Lifshitz or the Landau-Lifshitz equation here, which says that if you take this energy functional and take its uh, variational derivative, then that, that derivative acts as an effective magnetic field and the magnetization should evolve by precessing in that effective magnetic field. So for example, the exchange term generates the Laplacian. This is the, from the chiral term and so on. So that's our basic dynamical equation here. Uh, to really understand this equation mathematically, it's good to see that it has a nice structure geometrically and also as a, as a Hamiltonian system. All right, so to see this structure, you have to uh, understand the, the simple geometry here. Uh, so the first thing to remember is that this, the, since the magnetization vector is a map into a manifold, its derivatives are lying in the tangent plane at each point to the, to the sphere. And in the case of the sphere, the tangent plane is very easy to understand. It's just the orthogonal complement of the position vector on the sphere itself. Okay, so the, the PDE is taking place, uh, if you like, on the tangent plane. And then we can understand what this strange looking uh, cross product is doing geometrically is just to rotate on the tangent plane by 90 degrees. So we can think of this as a, this rotation as a symplectic operator doing a, a rotation on the tangent plane. Uh, if we're dealing with tangent vector fields and we want to differentiate them and still be dealing with tangent vector fields, then we have to differentiate them covariantly. So in other, in other words, when we take a, a tangent vector field and differentiate it, we get the covariant derivative by projecting that derivative back into the tangent space point-wise. And that's really how we should think about differentiating tangent vector fields. And in particular, when we're taking the gradient of the energy functional, this is what we should be doing. We should be taking the usual variational derivative and projecting it back into the tangent space, uh, which is equivalent. For example, if we're looking at the, uh, the exchange term, the Laplacian, which is equivalent to taking first a usual derivative and then a, a covariant derivative. And this projection results in nonlinear terms. And somehow this is, so this is where, where the nonlinearity in this problem is coming from, is coming from the, the geometric constraint. Okay, so this equation is some kind of abstract, if you like abstract Hamiltonian system, but maybe more precisely, it's a, it's a geometric version of the Schrodinger equation. And in particular, if you take only the exchange energy terms so that you're just dealing with the Laplacian here, then it really is the natural generalization of the usual Schrodinger equation from a complex target to a, to a curved target, in this case, the two sphere. And in this case, it's, it's usually called the Schrodinger map equation. Okay, so that's the, the nice structure. A couple more observations about this equation are the scaling and, and the topology of, of the maps. Uh, 
Okay, so the scaling is very simple. Uh, we scale X, we scale T, and we don't scale outside, and that preserves at least the, the pure isotropic version of this equation, the Schrodinger map, where we don't include any other terms. Or if you like, that's the highest, highest order derivative term in the equation. And uh, the observation here is that this scaling is exactly the one that leaves invariant the energy or the leading term in the, in the energy, which is our main conserved quantity. So this is, if you like, this is an energy critical equation, which uh, generally means it's some kind of a borderline type equation where you can imagine that some kind of singularity formation or collapse via scaling is at least possible without violating energy conservation. Okay, so it's an energy critical equation. And then the other thing I want to mention is the, is the topology. Okay, so what we're gonna do is fix a boundary condition at infinity. So I'm gonna assume my maps tend, at infinity tend uniformly to a fixed, uh, fixed vector to a, to a constant, in which case I can think of these maps as maps between two spheres if I like. And to such maps, I can associate the usual uh, classical degree of the map, which you can in fact compute by this formula that's written here. And you can check that this is, this is an integer, this degree. So this is in the physics literature, this is sometimes called the skirmion number. And my main interest, I guess, in this talk is, is topologically non-trivial situations where the skirmion number is non-zero. I see um, there's a, a question, maybe several questions in the chat. I don't, or, or in the, um, people have hands up. So I wonder if there's, if there's any questions here. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so it's a topological question. So, so you've compactified R2 by having this fixed vector at infinity. Uh, I was interested in what you can see if you take periodic domains, so a flat torus. Ah, okay. Yeah, so, so everything I say until the very end of this talk will be on R2 and not in the, in the periodic case. I guess in the, in the periodic case, you would have to look at individual um, uh, cells in order to understand something about the topology. But this, this statement is, is just about configurations defined on the whole plane. With a, with a constant field at infinity. Right, yeah. right. Yeah, yeah, it was just for, for just out of curiosity, what conceptually might change if you go to the topology of a periodic domain? That was that. You don't have to answer now. We can save that perhaps to the very end. Yeah, maybe that's a, that's a good question actually for the last slide. Super. I'll come back. Thanks. Yeah. Oh, I think there might be another question. Yeah. I'm sorry. I I can't hear. Is there a muting thing? No, I think it's unmuted. But maybe. Ah, that's better. No, sorry, we still can't hear you. That was me, Stephen, I think, talking. <laughs> I think. Uh, uh, do yeah, you I... hear me now? Yes. Uh, now, yes. Oh, okay. fine. Thank you. Uh, okay. Uh, you have used the uh, name Skirmian. What is the uh, origin of this, of this uh, name Skirmian? Because Skirmian is a, a field configuration in Skirmian model. Right. Yes. And uh, what is the relation between uh, Landau Lipschitz uh, model uh, and Skirma model? This is baby, has a baby Skirma model, yes? Because here you have two, dimen two dimensional configurations, yes? Right. 
Yeah, if you like. So I, I'm just using some terminology which is common in the in the magnetic literature. I mean, this is nothing complicated. This is just the usual degree of a map. Um, but solutions that I'm going to show later that have this uh, degree non-zero, they're sometimes just called skirmions. But I think by analogy with the classical skirmi uh -huh. model, not not by some actual equivalence. I think it's just terminology, in other words. Anyway, you, you, maybe you can see when, when we get to that part. Yeah, thanks. Are there are there any other questions? It's it's weird. I, I don't see anybody while I'm while I'm going through my slides, so I feel like I'm talking into empty space. If there are you can always put questions in the chat too, so I can see the chat. Okay, good. Thanks. Okay, so let me uh, just say a few things about the well posedness issues with this landau lipschitz equation. Okay, so it's, uh, to begin with, it's a strange looking equation. Um, for example, it's, it's not just, just written bold, bold, uh, boldly, it's not semi-linear, there's no obvious reference equation, you have weird, weird things like this. So you have to do something to make sense of this equation and see what you're dealing with. So, so one thing you can do, which is often done with geometric, equation, geometric equations, is to look uh, not at the map itself, but at its derivatives. And its derivatives live in uh, tangent space, which is a linear space. So they live in more conventional spaces. But um, of course, the tangent space um, changes as you as you move around the, the manifold. So you have to describe your tangent vectors by choosing some kind of orthonormal frame. So the idea here of this moving frame method is that you have, let's say you have a, a solution, maybe a, a, a nice solution to your equation, which describes a unit vector. And then you're gonna complete that into a orthonormal basis of unit vectors for each X and T. So these additional vectors are then describing the, the tangent space, which is where derivatives of the map lie. And so if you start differentiating your solution, that's a tangent vector, you can express it in this uh, orthonormal frame and it's conventional to use, if you have two directions, it's conventional to use complex coordinates. So these size are just the complex coordinates of the of the uh, derivatives. And then um, when you when you differentiate these tangent vector fields covariantly, you also uh, you end up differentiating the the frame as well. You have to understand how der derivatives of the orthonormal frame behave. So that's kept track of by these AJs, these connection coefficients, which are the coordinates for derivatives of the frame. And then you can easily check that if you do, if you covariantly differentiate a, a vector field in coordinates, it corresponds to, um, different, it, it corresponds to the op this operation here, this covariant derivative with the, with the AJ coefficient involved. And then to, to complete the story here, you need to look at the, the curvature relation, how the covariant derivatives commute. And for the case of the, since the target is very simple, the sphere, you get a very nice simple relation between these, uh, the, this, these covariant derivatives and, uh, and the derivatives of the map itself. You use all this information, you can write an equation for each of the spatial derivatives of the map, which is this guy here. Okay. And so now, now you see it looks kind of like a, a Schrodinger equation. In fact, so this is this is a time derivative and these are space derivatives. 
And this is the nonlinearity coming from the geometry, which is basically a cubic. So this is like a cubic nonlinear Schrodinger equation. And if you include the chiral term in the equation as well, which I'm interested in doing, it gives you this additional derivative type uh, nonlinear term. Okay. So this is a system of, uh, if you like, cubic magnetic Schrodinger equations, which is often called the modified Schrodinger map, at least when you don't have the chiral term. It's derived, derived geometrically from the original Schrodinger map equation. Uh, if, this, if this were a true cubic Schrodinger equation, then uh, the life would be perfect. You would have a very nice well-posedness theory um, even in the energy space. So the energy space being uh, H1 Sobolev space for the original map and so L2 for the derivatives of the map. But of course it's, uh, it's not. So these derivatives are covariant derivatives. And so the, the connection coefficients, the AJs, which are themselves dynamical variables are buried inside those covariant derivatives. And so actually it's quite a difficult system to, to analyze. One thing you can exploit is the gauge freedom. So I said, choose an orthonormal basis, but of course there are many choices of orthonormal basis. And once you have one, you can generate many others by rotating. And this allows you to, to choose whatever you think is an advantageous uh, gauge choice. So one common example would be the, the Coulomb gauge where you, you can choose the, the A to be di divergence free which at least generates a nice elliptic equation for the, uh, the vector potential in terms of the field derivatives. But it's certainly not the only choice. There are other choices and in some situations, this is not the, the best choice, but at least you can play around with that. Okay, so as a result of these, um, technical challenges that I mentioned, uh, for example, controlling the, uh, the vector potential and treating the, the derivative terms which appear in those covariant derivatives perturbatively. I would say the well-postedness theory is not really so satisfactory for this problem. And in fact, there's an even bigger issue, which I'd like to highlight here in the case where you, you're interested in topologically non-trivial solutions. And there the issue is in constructing an orthonormal frame for, that, for the procedure on the previous slide in, in the first place. Uh, so one natural way of constructing the orthonormal frame if you have trivial topology, which is to say you have some homotopy of your map, so I called it M before this should be an M. Your map with a trivial map, a constant map. If you have a constant map, then you have an obvious uh, explicit orthonormal frame. And you can, if you have the homotopy, you can, you can transfer this frame via the homotopy back to a frame for your original map. Of course, you can't do this in the topologically trivial case. So uh, so the orthonormal frame method is not necessarily so, so useful and you have to do something else. As a result of all of this, the, there's some gaps, I would say, in, in the well-posedness theory. So if you want to consider the general case, for example, with no, um, no topological triviality, then it seems very roughly speaking that this, the best you can do is take initial data at the, at the level of the Sobolev space H3, which you could say is uh, two, two derivatives worse than what you'd like, ideally, which would be the energy space. Okay, so this is, this is, this is a long story and it's, it's difficult because you have to 
you, you don't have the orthonormal frame method, so you have to do something to construct a solution, either uh, discretization, which is, I think is what the, the original old paper of Sulem Sulembardos was doing, or a regularization by a, by a wave map, which is what McCahagan did. And I, I'd like to just highlight this recent work of Shimizu, which uh, figured out how to incorporate the uh, chiral term into the local well closedness theory. Uh, if you're willing to consider topologically trivial solutions, then you can do better by about a derivative, it seems. That's again a, a long story with many contributions. But in this case, you, you have the possibility of using orthonormal frames. The, the one result which really goes to the energy space level is this um, paper of Bejanaro Ionescu, Kennegan and Tataru which proved the global well posedness in the case of small energy. Um, and then there were some, some refinements of that coming later. But the main point I, I want to make is that there's still some, there's still some significant gaps here. So lowering the regularity for the well posedness theory seems like a serious challenge and especially in topologically non-trivial situations. Okay, so I think that's all I wanna say about well posedness. And now move on to uh, topological solitons, starting with, starting with the isotropic case where your energy functional is just the exchange energy or the Dirichlet energy. And minimizing this can be done easily and explicitly. Uh, starting with this observation, this uh, Bogomolny type bound on the energy, this complete the squares kind of argument, which shows that uh, the energy is bounded from below by the topological degree, by this thing that I called the skirmion number before. And that you can saturate this lower bound by solving a first order equation. And indeed, this first order equation is really just the Cauchy-Riemann equation for this Kähler manifold that is your, your target space. For us, it's the sphere, or if you, if you want to do a stereographic projection from the sphere to the complex plane, it's, it's the honest to goodness Cauchy-Riemann equations, which you can solve explicitly. And you can check that once you've fixed, fixed your topology, your, your, your degree n and your, uh, your boundary condition, you can write down a four n dimensional family of harmonic maps, which all minimize, globally minimize the energy for fixed topology. To see what's going on a little bit better, it's, it's convenient to, um, to make some sy symmetry restriction. So one can consider maps which have equivariant symmetry. So that's what's expressed here. So the idea, this R is a rotation. So the idea is if you rotate by an angle omega in the domain, that corresponds to N rotations by the angle omega on the target space. And when you have a configuration like this and you set your boundary condition at zero and if infinity appropriately, then this little n, which describes the winding or the equivariance class is the same as the skirmion number, the degree of the map. In particular, if you take your explicit minimizers and restrict to n the n equivariant ones, then you reduce the family to a, a two parameter family, which is written basically explicitly here. So you have a, a rotation parameter. And the thing I want to highlight is a scale parameter. 
So we, we saw from the beginning that the, the equation is scale invariant in two dimensions. So your family includes a, a scaling parameter. So just to kind of summarize what we have here for the isotopic, uh, isotropic problem is um, we have these objects, which they have various names. They're sometimes, well, they're harmonic maps. They're sometimes called bubbles. They're also sometimes called skirmions. They have roughly this shape as vector fields in the plane. And, and they're in, they are in a sense stable. So in what sense are they stable? They, first of all, they're topologically stable in the sense that you can't completely destroy them by continuous deformations for topological reasons. Uh, secondly, they're, they're energetically stable in the sense that they're all energy minimizers. And so you can't destroy them without adding energy if you like. But on the other hand, there's still this this scaling invariance, which allows uh, which allows them to uh, collapse, for example, and so from a from a physical or maybe even a technological point point of view, this is less than satisfactory. Okay, so that's just vague stuff, but we can we can ask precise mathematical questions about the stability of these objects. And so this is this is some older older work, but there's still some some open questions to mention here. So again, we're looking at the pure Schrodinger map equation, and let's consider that equation within the class of equivariant little n equivariant maps, which is in, which is actually preserved by this equation. And the takeaway is that the, the higher degree, higher winding number ones are stable in a precise asymptotic sense. Whereas the low degree, degree one maps are unstable in the sense that solu nearby solutions can blow up in finite time. And let me just make a remark here that this is a situation when you have this equivariant symmetry, this is a situation where you can actually productively use a version of the moving frames method, even though the topology is non-trivial, but that's because of the symmetry. And in fact, using this method, you see that what, what you get as an effective equation is something much closer to a real cubic nonlinear Schrodinger equation than what we saw in the situation without symmetry. Okay, so there's a couple of obvious open problems here. One is there's this weird gap at winding number two. So as far as I know, we don't we don't know the situation for near harmonic dynamics in uh, winding number two. And the other thing is that this these blow up this blow up construction of Merrill, Raphael, and Rodniansky in degree one. There's a natural question of whether that persists when you include other terms in your equation, the chiral term, for example, or indeed when you include dissipation in the equation. Related to this, I want to mention uh, the situation. So those are topologically non-trivial solutions. It's the situation for topologically trivial solutions. So for example, if your energy is below the minimum energy for, for a non-trivial uh, topology, so in this case, the degree is necessarily zero, it's natural to expect that you might have a global solution, global smooth solutions to this equation. But that's, uh, as far as I know, still an open question. There's a, a kind of partial result along these lines with the equivariant symmetry, but with the boundary conditions chosen so that you still have overall um, top, uh, topologically trivial map. 
So in this, in this situation, it turns out that the, the energy threshold is eight pi for these boundary conditions. And if the energy is below four pi, then it's been proved that, that you do have global solutions. So it's sort of halfway there. Even? Yes, please. Sorry. So you say that if they, if the winding number is too high, then you have, they are stable. If the winding number is one, then they're unstable, but then you would expect that if the winding number is zero, they're again stable. Uh, winding number zero is, is trivial. But then, so everything is global. You That's have no finite time blow up in winding number zero. Uh, so the winding number zero, if you like, is the small energy situation of Bejin Aro, Ionescu, Kenig, and Tataru. Even, even without symmetry. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But so I guess the finite time blow up has to involve some form of rotation or. Uh, it, well, I, I guess the, the construction that, that's known, the one I mentioned here, is of course it's uh, using a collapsing harmonic map. Okay. And those will not exist if n equals zero. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. Good. Okay. So let's. Um, Let's move from the isotropic case where the solitons are these harmonic maps to something uh, of a little more current activity and interest, I think. And that's when you also have this chiral interaction term in your energy. Uh, so in, in the physics literature starting around the 90s, I guess there was this, this idea emerged, especially from Bogdanov and collaborators that um, a term, a, a, a DM or chiral interaction term of this type, well, first of all, should, should be operative in some materials, which are sometimes called chiral materials. And secondly, should allow uh, the stabilization of these skirmions that I men mentioned in the, in the previous slide can, can collapse and cause singularities stabilize them and so that you would then have honest to goodness stable uh, topological solitons and that these might be uh, interesting and, and useful. And in fact, relatively recently, such, such solutions were observed experimentally. So here's some kind of uh, experimental picture, uh, experimental pictures on the right, I guess, and cartoons on the left uh, where there's different phases produced by different strengths of magnetic field. So I guess at the top is a weak external magnetic field and there's some kind of a, a one dimensional type magnetization configuration that's observed. And then when the external field is very high, you have a purely ferromagnetic state where everything's pointing in the same direction. But in between is this, is this skirmion phase where these stable skirmions are observed uh, not exactly isolated, but um, well, depending on the strength of the field, I suppose, but somehow arranged in, in lattices. Okay, so these things are, are supposed to be interesting, even potentially as um, for uh, magnetic uh, storage or, or whatever. If you can, if you have stable stable topological solitons, which you can manipulate, then in principle, that, that can be something useful. Okay, so mathematically, how do we get a, a hold of these things? Um, well, again, we can impose some symmetry if we, if we want. Uh, this, this chiral term actually breaks rotational symmetry. But if you do this equivariant transformation where you rotate inside and outside, with a winding number one, then the chiral term is preserved. And you can also show it's preserved under this additional reflection symmetry. And so this, this allows you, if you want to just look for static solutions, this allows you to restrict to 
an even smaller class than the equivariant class, which is this sometimes called co-rotational class, where you can describe your maps by a single profile function of the radial variable. Okay, so th this is this is a picture from one of the physics papers. So this would be the this this would be the uh, the profile function u. Okay, so you can try to a natural thing to try to do is to is to impose the boundary conditions which give you this non-trivial topology, this skirmion type structure, and try to minimize the energy. Okay, so you can do this. Um, and there's some recent mathematical results about this. So first of all, uh, Lee and uh, Melcher proved that this equivariant minimizer has, has nice properties in particular. Well, it's monotone, it's unique, and it is indeed uh, stable. So it produces a, a solution which is stable against perturbations, even perturbations outside of the, the symmetry class. Stable in the energetic sense. And then uh, there's some recent work I did with a student, Li Wang, which somehow makes this a bit more precise and, and describes the structure of this uh, co-rotational skirmion solution by relating it to the isotropic uh, bubble solution of the, that produces a harmonic map. The idea is that in, in this parameter regime, where the, the coefficient of the chiral term is very small, the solution is almost a bubble suitably rescaled. There's the scaling and we can quantify both the, the deviation from this and, and this, this length scale in terms of the parameter K. And we can also use this to to obtain stability information. Okay. So I don't think I wanna to spend too much time on this, but I, I could mention at least some open problems. Okay, so what we did here is we, we took the general energy functional and we restricted to these co-rotational maps and we study properties of the minimizer in this co-rotational class. There's also a minimizer without any symmetry restriction at all. But it, so far, it seems to be an open question whether these two minimizers agree or not. In other words, whether the, the unconstrained global minimizer is symmetric. So this is a, a purely calculus of variations question like uh, secondly, the only the only things we know about these skirmion solutions are in this small k parameter regime. So without without the the smallness outside of this asymptotic regime, a, an open question is to say to say anything such as stability for these solutions. And then a third open question would be to look at the dynamics. So this is all. Um, stability in the energetic or spectral sense. So there's an, an issue there of looking at the, the land Lichitz dynamics and establishing some kind of stability or even asymptotic stability for these solutions. Okay, good. I, um, I am not, I'm gonna skip through a few slides here because time is running short. So I'm not gonna say anything in fact about the proof. Uh, nope. Which gives me just a, a couple of minutes to mention this lattice issue. Okay, so as we saw, I've been showing this experimental picture again. You don't really see isolated skirmion solutions like we were studying mathematically in the previous section. Although I guess in some parameter regime, there's, they're somewhat isolated.
but in fact they they come together in some kind of a lattice so there's maybe an interesting mathematical problem there to understand uh, these lattices of topological solitons so there's some interesting recent work by lee and melcher uh start starting starting to look at this by considering the bifurcation problem so here you start you start with just the zero solution. So this is this is very different from a unit length solution. And and look at the possible bifurcations with particular lattice periodicity from this trivial solution. And observing which patterns at, at the linear level, which patterns emerge. And what they found is that you can have these uh, helical patterns, which are basically these guys. And something called a vortex anti vortex type pattern, but also this skirmion type pattern. Interestingly, only in the case of the hexagonal lattice and only uh, as an unstable solution at this at this linear level but on the other hand they also did some numerics for this uh, full model where you have the unit length constraint and there they do see uh, lat scare me on lattices arising presumably stable ones in in certain parameter regimes uh, so that's, I think, a potentially interesting um, direction for some, some further analysis. Okay, so my goal was to stop at 10.2 in case there were some questions and we're there. So I think I'll stop there and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Are there questions? Thank you very much, Stephen, for the beautiful talk. Are there questions for Stephen? Even? Yeah, Bill, how about okay. So, in the case when you have global existence, do you also know the asymptotic dynamics? You have just linear scattering? It's scattering, yeah. So, either in the case where you're near a harmonic map, it's scattering to one of the harmonic maps. In the topologically trivial case, it's scattering to zero. Or to, I guess, to a constant map is the right way to say it. Um, another question. Um, so at least mathematically, you could also change the target space to be anything with a complex multiplication. Um, are there any physical relevance or model when this would also be something you want to do? Um, yeah, physically, I'm not so sure, but certainly mathematically, it's an interesting thing that lots of people have, have tried. Um, a, lot of, a lot of the well posedness theory, it doesn't really matter so much what your target manifold is. But in terms of what you get for uh, harmonic maps and solitons and so on, that's going to vary from target to target. And yeah, I mean, there are some some people have looked at maps into hyperbolic space, for example. So yeah, it's a thing you can do. Uh, off the top of my head, I don't know what all the results are, but it's certainly an interesting thing you can try. Okay. But more mathematically, at least there is no model where you would have yeah, for, for me, I, I don't know any case that's physically relevant other than the sphere. Oh, I'm sorry, another question. So if you have chiral, if you did not have the chiral term, then you had this Hamiltonian structure. You still have it with the chiral? Oh, you still, yes. As, as long as the, the term is, it comes from an energy, then you still have the Hamiltonian structure. Okay. Yeah, so you, you still have the conserved energy and all that. Okay. Thanks.
Uh, I have a question, if I if I may. Um, so uh, obviously, I'm I'm, I'm reminded of uh, Ginsburg Landau vortex lattices when I see this last slide here. Um, and in in that case, you can sort of uh, there's there's a heuristic that has been proved in various ways that says that the, the size of a vortex is of characteristic size epsilon, where epsilon is the the, the GL parameter. Is there a way to sort of read off the, the, the size of this sort of skirmion or the, the scale of the skirmion in terms of the various parameters that are that are in the model? Uh, you're thinking of the lattices? Yes, yes, specific. Well, um, uh, yeah, if you take it, the if the you lattice. take an if you take an isolated skirmion, then the, the the theorem that I showed briefly determines essentially the length scale. Uh, in terms this was of the, the parameters, the, the beta of k thing. The that's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, in, in the lattice, are they roughly of the same size? You think, or I, I guess I mean we don't really. I think we don't really know much about the real situation where where you have yeah. the constraint. So we just we just know this linear linear analysis, which it boils down to computing things that are in the kernel of the linearized operator, which respects certain lattice symmetries. So I guess you, you probably know everything about, uh, about those small bifurcating solutions. But then I guess we, we know maybe, maybe close to nothing about the, the large solutions. Thanks. So Ian, does everyone, uh, so I have a question for Ian, sorry, Steve. Is, does everyone have the right to unmute themselves or uh, or are they muted? Well, I think. Uh, right, I forgot to do that. Give me a second. Got some messages. Okay, everyone now has the right to unmute themselves, but of course, in, in giving everyone the right, I have to mute everyone. So uh, Stephen, please unmute yourself. Yeah, so I think Michael had a question. Uh, go ahead, yeah, Michael. Thanks. So, yeah, thanks, Ian. So maybe I, my, my original question, I just want to pause on it because when I come back to Ian's point, which is if you think of these sort of characteristic length scales, setting these structures, I guess what would interest me is what's known about the defect-defect interaction or skirmion-skirmion interaction when they're well separated. And, and the question I was gonna ask goes back to the energy scale. So you had this estimate bounding the energy by the uh, topological number. Mm -hmm. And I was sort of thinking in my mind about the two-dimensional uh, analog where you have a unit vector field with the same gradient energy with an S1 target. And then you have basically, again, a topological winding number that you can specify from a boundary condition. But you recognize that although you have singularities that are you know, topologically necessary for the radially symmetric solutions, the higher order winding number uh, solutions of an energy which doesn't scale linearly with the winding number. And so there's a sort of a, an instability which says that the winding number is sufficiently high, it would in some sense find a pathway to break up into lower order pairs or triplets. So my question is, do you have the same thing here where you think of these solutions which have the higher winding numbers, are they dynamically or energetically unstable to decomposition? Uh, they they are energetically completely flat. Ah, so this everything is the one, once you've ah. yeah, this is I'm talking about ah, the, the the pure pure isotropic case. Once you fix the topology, all the minimizers have exactly ah, that's the that same. dimension you mentioned. There's a manifold completely of degenerate. Ah, yeah, I see. I yeah. see. Okay, so that's not the same thing, right? Yeah, and and for the dynamics of the interactions when you have well separated skirmions. Assuming that they have these localized length scales that demarcate them if they're far apart and you have a family of them, what's known about the dynamics of skirmions? Because it would seem that uh, they naturally flow into these low energy states. Yeah, I think order. I think the answer is not very much at all. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we have with these equations, we have trouble. As I mentioned before, we even have trouble with the the basic well posedness theory. So there's 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 a lot of issues there. Um, well, what, what I had in mind, match that also, something, sorry. something much less ambitious, match that mm -hmm. analysis, not a not a theorem in the first instance. Yeah. What, what's conjectured? 
oh this okay i don't i don't know so so you you could you could in principle try to compute you're thinking of like the interaction between two widely spaced skinions yeah, yeah. yeah i mean these are not um extremely well localized objects they have very long slow well, that's why tails. that's why i was going back to ian's point about what's what sets the scale right yeah and so yeah, that that could be difficult just because mm -hmm. the the scale is so uh, they're certainly not exponential they're they're slow slow long tail objects but and i guess so in principle one could try something like this I, i'm not aware of if this has been done or not yeah, great talk thanks Okay, so uh, let me let me ask a couple of questions. So, first question is that so you were looking at the abelian gauge theory here. Am I okay? Yeah. So your yeah your uh, curvature curvature is given just by curl of the curl of the uh, connection. Right. Derivative of the connection. There is no continuity. So is there non-abelian one? Right. Yeah, you, you would know better than me. I, ha I, have, I have no idea if there's some natural setting where that would arise. Okay, so the another, uh, well, question or, or remark is that one way to think about the scale of these lattices. So you glue together, assume you can glue together uh, uh, skirmions in, in a lattice. And then you optimize the energy with respect to the distance. Right, yeah. And my concern would be that the, the decay is so slow that it would be difficult to do this gluing, but maybe there's a way. Yeah, you would have a huge, well, you have to, that's right. So the gluing would be hard. But so, for example, if you take the Ginsburg lambda vortices without magnetic fields in, in superfluids, they also decay slow. Yeah. Nevertheless, they are observed in nature. Yeah, I, I agree. Okay. Status show. Okay, I, I have a meeting now, uh, so I have to get off, but maybe still we can discuss later. Sure. So, so Enjoy yeah. your meeting. Well, it's a two hour meeting, which is not supposed to be enjoy enjoyable. <laughs> so, are there other questions uh, for Steven? I guess maybe I'll just ask one. So just to summarize, if you look at the, even just one scheme on a dynamical problem, you're saying that basically like very little is known uh, in this case. Yeah, so I would or, say- you know, One scheme, let alone like two interacting or you know something. Yeah, so what you could do is stay in the symmetry class and try to understand the dynamics near a skirmion, chiral skirmion in the, in the symmetry class. The simplest. That that's that would be that would be a first step, mm -hmm. but our our even our well posedness theory without without symmetry and without um, and it, with 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 uh, topological degree is it's pretty poor. So maybe start with the symmetric problem. I think it's it's possible. Sense. Well, thanks. So if there are no more questions. Probably just a few seconds. Uh, we can thank uh, Stephen again for the great talk. Thank, thank you all. Nice to sort of see you all. Yeah, nice to see you. Hope to see you soon in, uh, in a better form. Yeah. All right. <laughs>